Why hello there, my name is Sarah from Lothian and welcome to Monumental Mysteries at the State Library of Victoria. Hmm. The Victorians, the ones living through Queen Victoria's reign, not the ones in the newly formed state of Victoria, though there is some overlap there. They're crazy about public art. They thought that when the general populace was exposed to uh, statutory in the streets, it improved intelligence, it lifted moral fibre, and it made people better citizens. So everyone, from the famous explorers Burke and Wills, to the library's founder, Sir Redmond Barry, to local councillors who no one remembers anymore, for example, this is William Ivers Senior, who, although was heavily involved in a number of charities, is mainly remembered as a real estate agent and a local councillor by those who remember him at all. They were all immortalised in public sculpture so that the population would be inspired and embiggened by their lives and deeds. The Victorians felt that statutory, even to myths and legends and noble beasts, would help improve society. So they installed kangaroos surrounding a drinking fountain, St George and his dragon in the library forecourt, and even a bust of Hercules in the Queen Victoria Gardens. The State Library has a number of these monuments designed to improve society, and today we're going to look at the mysteries surrounding three of them. So our first is following the story of two well-travelled bronze lions that were installed in the forecourts in the 1860s. In 1862, Sir Edmund Barry, the first president in the library, went to Europe, England and America to purchase more books and artworks for the library. While he was in London, he purchased two bronze lions for a small sum. They are similar to the lion statues surrounding Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. Those lions were made from bronze melted down from cannons on captured French ships. Our lions, unfortunately, were made of lesser quality material, as we shall see. In 1873, the library hired historian Marcus Clark as a secretary and later as a sub-librarian. The lions figured in Clark's daily life. He would leave the end of his lunchtime cigar in one of the lions' mouths to signal to his friends that he was at his post in the library and available for visits. The lions don't feature much in the documentation of the library, but listed under 1924 in the Book of the Public Library, Museums and National Gallery of Victoria, there was a brief mention stating, two metal lions that had for many years been on the top of the steps of Swanson Street entrance had become so dilapidated that it was resolved to remove them and they were handed over to the Royal Zoological Society. So we head over to the Melbourne Zoo. In their minutes for December 1924, it reads, Two metal lions at the entrance of the library might be done away with. If the zoo want them, trustees said they could have them. Director Wilkie inspected them, several big cracks in the figures. Offer of metal lions accepted with thanks. And then in February 1925, lions received from public library, dilapidated, but when position found, they can be fixed up. And that's when they disappear. A zookeeper who was retiring in the 1990s and started in the 1960s said he vaguely recalled two dilapidated metal lions, but he thought that they were probably thrown out in the great clean-up in the 1960s. I like to think of them presiding over hills of trash somewhere. The lions are, however, remembered in the forecourt today. These benches now sit where once two lions lounged, smoking second-hand cigars. In 1905, Bernard Hall, who was the director of the National Gallery, which shared a building with the public library, headed overseas to buy artworks for the gallery. Um, one of the things he wanted to do was buy a big statue to even out the St George in the forecourt. He visited the studio of Emmanuel Fremier and after some discussion of maybe purchasing a second statue of St George, uh, they settled on the statue of Joan of Arc. Hall had paid for the Joan of Arc statue to be gilded, but at some stage during the making process he'd clearly decided against it. So when the Joan of Arc arrived, it came with a second smaller crate accompanied by a letter. In it, Fremier stated that to make up the difference of payment for the gilding, he was sending a small statue of his gorilla and woman. Fremier first worked with this theme in 1859, where he submitted a similar statue to the Paris Salon, which was deemed too confronting both for its graphic violence and its proximity to current debates about evolution, 1859 being the year that Charles Darwin's work On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection was published. Audiences and judges alike felt that it was a statue charged with primal urges and felt certain they knew what the gorilla had in store for his prisoner. It was eventually allowed in the salon, but set well back in a niche behind heavy green velvet curtains. In 1887, Fremier returned to the subject, submitting a variation of his original statue to the Paris Salon, this time claiming the coveted Medal of Honour for the work. It was a smaller statuette of this second work that Fremier had gifted to the people of Victoria. In the accompanying letter, Fremier drew a quick sketch of the work and wrote, I would ask you, if you would be so kind, to display this work so that when the public come in, the first thing they see is the ape staring straight at them. I feel this is the group's best aspect. Yeah, not creepy at all. 
The statue was placed in the Stahl Gallery, now the Cohen Gallery, for a few months and was well received to start with. However, two months later it was noted in the Melbourne newspaper The Argus and then again in the Mount Alexander Mail a few days later. During the past few days, a good many inquiries have been made as to what has become of Fremier's statue, Gorilla and Woman. On inquiry, it appears that the trustees, though they had previously inspected it, have now become somewhat doubtful as to whether the subject, with its suggestion of horror, is altogether a suitable one for exhibition in a public gallery. It has been withdrawn, therefore, and placed temporarily in the boardroom, where anyone desiring to do so may see it. The statue is still housed in the National Gallery of Victoria's collection, and you can find it on their website. This is our third mystery involving Joan of Arc herself. I'm sure you know the story of Joan of Arc, so I'll sum it up really quickly. Joan was a young French peasant girl in the 1400s who claimed she had received visions of saints and angels telling her to support King Charles VII in the war against the English. She was sent by the king to the Siege of Orléans, where she helped inspire victory only days later. A year later, in 1430, she was at the Siege of Compiègne, where she was injured and then captured by French allies to the English and handed over for trial. Her trial did not go well for her, and on the 30th of May, 1431, she was burnt at the stake at 19 years of age. When Fremier's original statue was created in 1874, it was installed in the Place de Pyramide, which was purported to be where Joan had been injured and taken prisoner. However, it was not well received. The artist was criticised for making the statue too frivolous. A light-hearted, thoughtless girl perched on a big horse, bearing no relation, even by suggestion, to the gravity, earnestness and overwhelming solemnity of any phase of the martyr's life. There was also much made of Joan being depicted in such an active position and in form-fitting armour, when traditionally she was shown in peasant dress listening to voices or in her pageboy disguise. The version the National Gallery bought was also controversial. An age editor predicted that the statue would make us a laughing stock for every foreigner that heard of it. After all, this is 1906 and Victoria was culturally a colony of the British. And there's something really awkward to having a statue of a woman you burnt at the stake 400 years ago. When she was first taken out of the crate, she shone like gold. Although Fremier hadn't gilded her, bronze looks like gold or brass when it first comes out of the mould. Her sword was sheathed, her banner fluttered, and the wreath of victory adorned her head. You can see what she would have looked like back then in this photo of an original statue, which is now in Philadelphia. Bronze weathers differently over time depending on a lot of factors, including environment, weather and placement of the statue. So the dome of Flinders Street Station is bronze and has gone green over the 108 years since it was installed. And the statue of the first president of the library, Sir Redmond Barry, is black. Although I couldn't find any mention of the original colour, there is a patina that can be applied to bronze so they start out black and this might have happened here. Alternatively, bronze fade to black over the years, which is what's happened with the Joan of Arc statue. From as early on as 1920s, there were letters sent to newspapers complaining of her weathered appearance. In 1954 this photo was taken of Joan and you can see that she was in desperate need of a clean. Those stripes of white are also something that happens to bronzers out in the open. However, sometime between when that photo was taken and the 1980s when the condition report was commissioned, the wreath had gone missing. All that remains is a nub at the back of her head where once it was attached. Where and when it went or who took it remains a mystery. In fact, even the fact that she once had a wreath seems unknown to most people. The writer of the 1980s conservation report noticed the nub but thought it was where her banner was once attached and had somehow broken free in the years gone by. Two noble kings of the jungle who went missing, a killer gorilla and a saint who had her symbol of victory stolen. There are over five million items in the State Library collection. Thanks for listening to the story of three of them. Well, four of them because there were two lions. And there was the artist letter and the condition report and the two Argus letters and then the zoom minutes. So, I lost count. Nine. So nine of them. <laughs> Wait, the gorilla is the National Gallery of Victoria's and the zoo reports aren't. Seven. So thanks for listening to the story of seven of them. I'm flushed. Well, I've been talking about controversial statues.